I'm very happy to host uh, Anna and Kyle. Um, let me briefly introduce them. So Anna is a postdoc at MIT Quest for Intelligence. She has a PhD from MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Science, where she studied the neural mechanisms underlying language processing in humans. And today, Anna is examining the language thought relationship in large language models using her cognitive science training to identify similarities and differences between humans and machines. Uh, Kyle is an assistant professor of linguistics at the University of Texas at Austin, where he is a PI in UT Computational Linguistics Group. He works broadly on the topic of human communication and uh, specifically, he is interested in what modern computational language models can tell us about the human language, how linguistic efficiency can explain aspects of linguistic behavior and typology, and variety of other topics in, in the cognitive science of language. He received a master's degree in linguistics from Oxford, completed his PhD in brain and cognitive science at MIT, and did his postdoc in Stanford's Nature Language Processing Group. Thanks a lot for joining today, and we are very excited for the talk. So the stage is yours. Great. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, so I'm going to share first, and then at some point, I'm going to pass it over to Kyle. All right. So our goal today is to talk about large language models and what capabilities we think we should expect from them, what capabilities we think we shouldn't expect from them. And specifically, we're going to be talking about, broadly speaking, the relationship between language and thought. And in humans, of course, there is a tight link between the two. Language exists to deliver messages from one person's mind to another. So if I look outside my window and say, the sky in Boston is blue today, I can then communicate this message to you by saying the sky is blue. And the magical thing is that the content of your thoughts will then change. In your thoughts, you will have an image of a blue sky in Boston. And the link actually goes beyond that. So not only do you see this transfer occurring of information from one mind to another, but the recipient of the message, the listener, is actually making inferences about what's going on in the speaker's head. Because language is one of the few ways for us to figure out what's going on in so inside someone else's mind. So you might think, oh, well, I guess this person believes that the sky in Boston is blue today. How do they know? Did they check? Why would they tell me that? What was the intention behind that utterance? And so, this link is very helpful because it allows us to fill in the gaps and infer many of the things that go unsaid explicitly. But if it's taken too far, then there is some confusion that might result from conflating language and the underlying thought. And so in certain cases, this conflation can lead to logical fallacies. One such fallacy is observing someone or something being good at language and then inferring that they're good at thought. And you might have experienced that if you're listening to a really good public speaker who is fluent, who is cohesive, who is smooth, you are more likely to believe that they actually have important things to say, even if the underlying thinking is vacuous. The second fallacy is uh, observing some failures at certain aspects of thought, and then concluding that the language must be bad as well. And so that we see in certain criticisms of large language models today, where the critics point out some failure of these models in a say, math task or a logical task, and then dismiss them altogether as language models. And the third fallacy is not the one we're gonna be talking about today, because it's not large language model related, but it comes from the same family and it's also um, important and has serious implications. So observing somebody having issues with language and then in inferring that their thinking is also subpar. So if somebody has a strong accent or stuttering or a different kind of speech impediment, people are less likely to hire them or um, perceive them generally as less intelligent. So this kind of conflation happens all of the time. 
In computer science, of course, people have drawn a link between language and thought as well. And this goes all the way back to the Turing test, where the goal is for the observer to figure out whether they're talking to a human or to a machine based on a conversation. So this is an explicit task where you're supposed to infer the thinking from language alone. And as we know, these days a Turing test is not very useful because it's often it often fails. So the observer is actually misled by this fallacy. They observe uh, a chatbot being fluent, being conversant, using certain kind of conversational tricks, and then they infer that this must be a thinking human being. And so, what we want to talk about today is we want to use what we know about human cognition and the language thought link and um, apply this to large language models. So I told you already about the fallacies of conflating language and thought. And now I'm gonna tell you why we think it's really important to separate the two. And specifically, the way we separate them is we divide the capacities that we have into formal and functional linguistic competence. And we ground this distinction in neuroscience. And then we're gonna take this distinction and apply it to large language models. We're going to briefly introduce you to LLMs. We are going to show you that these models today are surprisingly good at formal competence, but still lag behind at many aspects of functional competence. And then finally, um, we will discuss the implications of the formal functional distinctions for building better, more human-like models of language use. All right. So why are we saying that it's really important to distinguish language proper from cognition more broadly? The reason why is because we know that this separation is really strong and really prominent in the human mind and the human brain. And in humans, language processing in the brain takes place within its own separate network. This observation really goes all the way back to 19th century, where two physicians, Paul Broca and Carl Wernicke, reported that patients who had damage to this area, now known as Broca's area, or this area, now known as Wernicke's area, had specific issues with language, language production, language comprehension, but their thinking and their logical reasoning and their executive functions remained intact. And so this was one of the earliest examples of the specialization of, fu of function within the brain, showing that the brain is at least in some ways modular, certain functions are tied to specific parts. And in the next century and a half, there have been a lot of other studies. And now we know that the simple broca wernicke model is incorrect. But roughly speaking, there is a specialization of functions for language. So now we know that there is a Network in the human brain, uh, the exact location varies from person to person, but roughly this is where it falls. And this network responds to different kinds of language, single words, phrases, sentences. It responds during both listening and reading, so different kinds of modalities. And it responds during both production and comprehension. It also is not specific to say English, it responds to many kinds of spoken languages and even sign languages. So this really seems to be the network for language processing in the brain. And um, in accordance with that, we see that the response in the language areas is really strong to all kinds of language processing. So the network is highly engaged when processing language but its response to other kinds of cognitive tasks is really low. So math, logical reasoning, conceptual reasoning, and others all activate this network weakly or not at all. And so this really highlights that this uh, network is specialized for language. And measuring how strongly the network responds to different kinds of tasks is one way to probe the selectivity, but there is also another. So Subsequent studies of um, individuals with brain damage show the same thing. So an extreme case of brain damage resulting from, say, a massive stroke is known as global aphasia. It results in massive deficits in both language production and language comprehension. And so this is a top-down view of some of those brains. So you see most of the left hemisphere is gone. But if the damage is mostly concerning the language areas, other aspects of thought 
survive. So these people can still do math, yeah, logical reasoning, conceptual reasoning, and other kinds of tasks. And so that really highlights that the language network is specialized for language itself. That said, obviously, this network alone would not be sufficient for us to use language in all of its complexity in the world. Why is that? Because language is not the end point. When we receive a message through language and we need to decode it and explain it, we then need to use this information in some other way. And so we might engage our social reasoning, inferring the intent behind somebody's words or figuring out what effect our words are going to have in somebody else's mind. We also engage a network responsible for broader situation modeling, so keeping track of various entities that were mentioned, different characters, say in a book or a narrative or a conversation, so this broader model of what's going on, what has been said. There are all kinds of areas responsible for specific aspects of world knowledge, including perceptual knowledge, so important for grounding our language. We, there is a multiple demand network responsible for general cognitive tasks like math and logic. So if you need to compute something, this is your network. And there is some evidence that semantic tasks, so reasoning in about the world, also engages its own set of regions distinct from the language network. And so in everyday life, we have this constant communication between the language network and all these other brain networks, brain areas. And you need all of this regions working together to really use language in all the kinds of circumstances in which we might wanna use it in the world. And so that means that we can take this insight and apply it to large language models. We can say, well, in humans, we know that there are all those mechanisms that are specialized for various kinds of capabilities. Do large language models today have these capabilities? And so we propose to divide up these capabilities into two camps. One is what we call formal competence. So language specific computations that are required for language comprehension and production that take place within the language network. And functional competence that includes non-language specific capabilities that we need to use language in the world, but they aren't language specific. They take place outside the language network and they can be applied to non-linguistic stimuli. So, very different, but also useful if we actually want to use our language. And just briefly to give you some examples um, that we'll dive into in just a bit, an example of formal competence, the keys to the cabinet are on the table, knowing that R needs to match the keys here. And so it needs to be R and not is, is an example of formal linguistic competence. On this side though, the example of 14 birds were sitting on a tree, three left, one joined. There are now 11 birds. 11 is incorrect. The answer needs to be 12. Knowing which number to put in here is an example of functional linguistic competence. In this case, knowledge of math is essential, even though what you get in the end is also a word. All right, and so now I'm going to pass it over to Kyle. And um, do we take questions? Like throughout, we're happy to take questions. Now, if there are any questions, please go ahead. Or we can leave it to the end. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. So picking up uh, where Anya left off. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about um, formal competence first in large language models, but first to kind of pause to just briefly review what I think we're probably largely familiar with this at this point, which is when we're talking about large language models, um, what are we talking about? So mostly we're thinking about the current class of large uh, neural network transformer models, right? So GPT-3, kind of the earlier generation of BERT models, now GPT-4 and ChatGPT, um, which are slightly different from language models, as we'll mention in a minute. Um, right, so these are models trained on enormous amounts of text, basically internet scale on word prediction tasks. Um, and then more recently, there's like a little bit more going on here, uh, which is that ChatGPT and GPT-4 and the very latest class of models um, have this extra layer on top of reinforcement learning from human feedback, 
which maybe makes them not quite language models in the traditional sense of just predicting words, right? But still this word prediction task is really core um, underlying all of these models. So the kind of uh, headline results of the last two years is that these models are becoming really good at um, all kinds of linguistic tasks, including uh, generating paragraphs of fluid and grammatical text in response to a prompt. So right, if you ask chat GPT to say, you know, what explain language models to a five-year-old, it's gonna do a really good job. The language model is a way for a computer to understand and generates um, human language. It's like a program that can read and write words and sentences. So this is really um, pretty good, right? It's grammatical, it's on topic. It has a lot of nice features um, uh, to it. So because it's so fluid and grammatical and on topic, um, it can we can kind of run into some of these fallacies that Anya mentioned earlier, right? The first of which is this idea that if you're good at language, that means you're good at thought. And so in some of the hype we see around these models, we do see claims like, well, when you read the algorithm with creating original sentences and the role of metafiction, it's hard not to feel the machine is thinking in some meaningful way. Um, right. So because we see it producing fluid, meaningful text, we say, oh, it must have fluid, meaningful thought. On the other hand, right, there's this, um, because it has these failures, like we'll talk about in some kinds of functional competence or logical reasoning or math, um, there are claims out there, like from Chomsky in 2019, and then even more recently, like, well, does this tell you about human, anything about human language? Zero, um, right? So we also, we kind of want to push back against both of these uh, directions of assuming an overly tight link between language and thought. So. Basically, we're going to explore the kinds of linguistic competence shown by language models, splitting them into these formal and formal and functional pieces, right? And the kind of first point we want to make is that these LLMs are surprisingly good at formal competence. And well, um, we kind of used to make a bigger deal about the word surprisingly uh, in at some point that was in the title of the, the paper preprint um, that we posted which is that I think it wasn't obvious, you know, several years ago that a word prediction task would lead to the kind of gains we've seen in formal linguistic competence. And by that, right, we mean specifically um, even language which cares about linguistic structure, right? So traditionally in 20th century and 21st century linguistics, uh, the thought was that, well, in order to get linguistic competence, we know human language requires rich hierarchical structure and grammatical categories and long distance dependencies and all kinds of um, interesting features that linguists have studied. And to do that, it was always thought, well, you need you know, some kind of trees, you need grammatical categories, parts of speech, constructional knowledge. Um, and these are the kinds of things that the language network seems to care about, right? The kinds of things that you need to put together locally coherent grammatical speech. What the language network does not care about are things like world knowledge, mathematical reasoning, and logical reasoning, right? And pushing on this claim about, right, um, if it's the case that to be formally linguistic competent, you need linguistic structure, there's been a bunch of work asking, well, can language models actually handle uh, tasks which seem to require that kind of structure, right? So that requires some kind of hierarchical understanding of language or some understanding of um, dependencies across, you know, large distances, can they do that even though they don't have built-in linguistic structure like trees or grammars? Uh, and so that's been a big body of work in the last several years, um, which I think is largely pointing to the answer to that to at least some extent, or even to a very large extent, yes, they are learning uh, structure. So a classic task now in this kind of subdomain uh, was popularized by Lindzen et al. in 2016, which is the subject verb agreement task. So in English, right, a subject of a sentence, like in this case, keys, has to agree a number with its verb, R. So we would say the keys to the cabinet are on the table. Where you've got this agreement between the plural subject keys and the plural verb R. And that's true, even though you have this intervening noun, cabinet, which uh, is singular, right? And so if you were to just look locally and have say an n-gram model, that would get this wrong, right? You would say cabinet is. So you could have imagine arbitrarily many distractors in here, 
Uh, but if a model has a correct notion of this is the subject and this is the verb, it's going to know that those have to agree and it doesn't matter how many intervening singulars there are. Um, so whether or not models can do this kind of hierarchical structure based on pure statistical learning is a really old debate in linguistics and cognitive science and computer science, um, really going back to the 40s and 50s when Claude Shannon first started uh, working with n-gram models and statistical language models and prediction engines, the kind of uh, forerunner of the modern language modeling task. And Chomsky pushed back and said, well, despite the undeniable interest and importance of semantic and statistical studies of language, they appear to have no direct relevance to the problem of determining or characterizing the set of grammatical utterances, right? So kind of early on making this claim, you know, no, statistical modeling is not going to get this rich, uh, these rich structural aspects of language. Um, this reemerged in the 80s when Remelhart and McClelland were making these early connectionist models. Um, thus, the behavior of the model was lawful, even though it contained no rules. And Pinker and Prince push back and say the connectionist claims about the dispensability of rules must be rejected. Um, this continued on, you know, with the kind of resurgence of deep learning and you know connectionist models reemerging as deep learning models in the 2010s and 2020s. Um, and then it's continued, you know, even as late as you know in the last couple of weeks. Steve Pansadosi uh, posted an article that said modern language models refute Chomsky's approach to language, and that's gotten lots of pushback. So um, our take is that uh, if we think about this formal versus functional distinction, we can actually shed some light on what some of these disagreements are about. And so we think that from the formal perspective, uh, we side with the people who say, yes, you can actually learn a lot of formal linguistic structure from statistics including stuff that seems to require hierarchy and abstraction, right? Like subject agreement, right? So if you play with ChatGPT, it's really hard to trip it up on a number agreement task. So even if you have something like the person who has the cats that the dogs with the cute faces and fluffy tails chased, so you've got lots of pearls and a singular subject here, it'll complete that with is correctly, you know, most of the time. It's hard to trip it up on this task. And that's true in general. So even on these systematic evaluation data sets for, um, interesting linguistic features like filler gap dependencies and island effects and subject verb agreement. Um, even models like GPT-2 were approaching human performance. Uh, and the more modern models are really doing very well at, at all of these tasks. Um, this is true even for uh, not just kind of things that require long distance or hierarchical structure, but even kind of construction. So this was a recent paper of mine looking at how GPT-3 does with the construction of beautiful five days in Austin. Um, so this is a kind of strange construction in English, which is really very rare, which is that you don't, usually we would say five beautiful days in Austin. Um, you can also use this kind of strange construction where the singular A actually takes the plural days and you reverse the order of the numeral and the adjective. Um, and it's generalizable to some instances, like a lucky three students or a mere five pencils, but certain adjectives don't allow it. So you can't say a blue five pencil. So it's a really interesting construction. Um, but if you look at this plot here, the bars are GPT-3's ratings of sentences in different categories. And the pink triangles are human ratings in these categories. And you get really actually subtle, fine-grained agreement uh, on the task between humans and GPT-3. Right, which suggests it's learning really interesting kinds of linguistic structure, even for constructions which are very rare. Um, so uh, that raises this question. Well, we're saying that they're really good at formal competence, right? But there's still some gaps, uh, like we'll talk about in functional competence and higher level semantics um, and a whole bunch of other functional tasks. So uh, our claim here is that higher level conceptual semantics and low level statistical semantics are actually distinct. So if I were to say a sentence, like I'll take my coffee with cream and blank, right? You might expect me to say cream or sugar or something, but instead I say dog. Um, this is a kind of classic example of a sentence that generates an N400 response in psycholinguistics. So it's something that the language network recognizes right away that this is a kind of strange wrong sentence. And this is the kind of sentence that language models will like very happily reject um, or assign low probability. This is, seems like a different kind of semantics. And this is something we're kind of still thinking through than uh, the kind of slower uh, logical reasoning required to figure out something like the dog that chased the cat with the red collar was bigger than the dog that chased the cat with the blue collar. 
And the cat with the blue collar was smaller than the dog that chased it, but bigger than the dog that chased the cat with the red collar. Right, so this is confusing, I think, even for a human to think through, you could like probably like think it through or write it down and figure out the answer. Um, but models actually struggle with that one. So here I asked ChatGPT, this was 3.5, uh, so this wasn't GPT-4 yet, um, and it got it wrong. So it said a bunch of reasonable statements and I think kind of elegantly demonstrated its formal linguistic competence, right, in knowing that, hey, you can refer to the cat with the blue collar as the blue collared cat, right? That's like a kind of core linguistic property but it actually gets the logic wrong. It says, yeah, you know, yes, this makes sense, although it might require some reasoning. Um, but the actual answer is no, it doesn't make sense, right? There's a logical contradiction there. Um, so the conclusion about formal competence is that the signal that you want to learn about language does seem to really be there in language, right? Contra some arguments from poverty of stimulus. And it seems like it can be used to learn interesting linguistic structure and to solve tasks, which seem to require that kind of structure, right? So you rarely see major mistakes in uh, usage when models generate, right? But then there's a question like, does that mean the language model you know, can do your taxes or solve whatever arbitrary task you throw at it? Uh, and we still think the answer to that, uh, well, they are getting better at a whole bunch of things is not quite, right? To assume that just because it can do fluent linguistic output means it can do all kinds of thought and other higher order tasks, um, that would be one of these fallacies uh, that we're talking about. Of, all right, that's not to say it can't do a bunch of non-linguistic tasks, right? We're seeing that they can do more and more tasks, um, but we think that they're distinct and that it's worth separating out and drawing that distinction. Um, so we're arguing that models are kind of lagging behind at this functional component, um, right? So uh, to kind of illustrate that, uh, we can call here on uh, Gary Marcus, who um, is a kind of <laughs> champion of the failures of functional competence, who points out that, you know, the models still get wrong, uh, at least ChatGPT uh, was still getting wrong a math problem. Like I went out to lunch the other day, Sam, Alice, and Barbara were there, plus three other people I didn't know. Um, how many people were there in total? The model says there were a total of eight people at lunch. Um, you know, depending on if you count yourself or not, um, <laughs> there's either six or seven people, right? There's not eight people. So, we want to make the point, this is not a linguistic failure, right? This is a failure of uh, mathematical reasoning. So the linguistics here, we say, is fine, right? It says, you know, it knows to put a number there. It kind of understands the question. The problem is not on the linguistic side. It's some other kind of failure. And so, you know, as a thought of experiment, you can imagine, like, if you removed all the math word problems from the training set, um, would it still learn how to do math, I think the answer is obviously no. And so the question then becomes, you know, well, it, we've seen, it seems like in an internet scale of data, there is signal to learn linguistic competence. Does that necessarily mean that the same data set will have competence to do all of these other things? Uh, and the answer is it's not obvious uh, and it's something um, we're still thinking about. So I'm gonna hand it over back to Anya here uh, to talk through a bit more about um, functional competence in these models. All right. Okay, so um, in the paper, we consider four different domains of functional competence. And of course, in practice, there are more than four. And for now, let's just focus on two domains because they've been uh, maybe the most prominent and I think some of the more striking examples of failures and people kind of trying to figure out whether or not the models have mastered them. So when it comes to formal reasoning, here is a plot from the GPT-3 paper. And um, this is the model's performance on basic arithmetic tasks. And so let's look at the largest model. We see that the model does really well at two digit addition subtraction. The three digit operations are also pretty good. But then when it goes to four digits, the performance really plummeted. And the same was true for two digit multiplication or even single digit operations where there were more than two operations involved. Um, and so anything that 
was com more complex, that was less likely to be present in the training data, that was harder to memorize, the model performed much more poorly at. And the same thing seems to be the case even with these more recent models, the uh, systematic investigations are still lacking, but there is some nice preliminary work showing that they memorize a lot of their math knowledge and if they can't memorize it, then they fail. And um, another example is, yes, if you, pay, if you try to apply this kind of structured reasoning to um, an exam, um, to a real life example, so here is navigation. If you follow these instructions, you return to the starting point, you take a certain number of steps, you turn around, and the question is, are you gonna end up in the same place? The answer is no. And this is plot from the Palm paper, so a different model, more recent. Um, and here we saw that the human experts were able to do it at 100%. People who just kind of you know did it online without any special training and paying much attention were um, okay, but that the model was really performing very poorly. So even their largest model, 540 billion uh, parameters was still way, way, way below human performance. And so these failures of formal reasoning really seem to be um, consistent. In ChatGPT, tons of people report that it fails to do even simple math for them, as Kyle mentioned. When it comes to the other domain, world knowledge, um, it's actually trickier because large language models learn a lot about the world simply by memorizing the statistics of their input facts that are provided in the text, either explicitly, like cats are mammals, or implicitly through co-occurrence statistics of cats and dogs going together, so maybe they're both pets. And um, that means that these models know quite a lot. But there are certain issues with the kind of knowledge that they acquire. This knowledge is, um, first of all, brittle. So it's easy to mislead the model or misprime it. So um, you might ask what the capital of Texas is. It will correctly say Austin. But if you prime it with, say, Boston, it might say the capital of Texas is Boston instead. And uh, in more recent variations, you can add, you, you can have a conversation with ChatGPT. Um, pretending that either you're an expert or you're a lay person and it's, and it's more likely to give incorrect answers when uh, talking to or pretending to be a lay person. And another big issue is paraphrasing. So Seinfeld, an American TV show, originally aired on NBC versus Seinfeld premiered on Showtime. So premiered and aired are um, two versions, two ways to say the same thing, but the model will often give you different answers in response to that same query, which shows that this response, this internal knowledge is not consistent. And if you think that these examples are too old and don't apply to more recent models, I was playing with ChatGPT this past weekend, asked what is bigger, a microwave or a snowman? And it said, a microwave is typically bigger than a snowman, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, a microwave is usually smaller in size than a snowman. So it reversed 180 over the course of the answer, showing that its reasoning is not consistent or its world knowledge is not consistent. Another issue is that this world knowledge is biased. So the models tend to overrepresent events that are overrepresented in the corpus. So in this study by Schwartz and Choi, they describe the so-called report of bias. So events that are rare, exciting, and interesting, like being born, being named, dying, are way overrepresented in the model, things that they're way more likely than they are in reality. And then if you ask the humans to report how frequent the events are, the more frequent events reported by humans in blue are thinking, breathing, and blinking. And of course, the model's probability of outputting those events is much lower. So they are the faithful representation of the world around us. They're biased in very systematic ways. And then finally, the knowledge is incomplete. So you could ask which of the two objects is bigger, like I did with the microwave or a snowman, and it will get it right a lot of the time, right? So the study in 20. It was done in 2020, but again, if you play with ChatGPT, you see you see the same thing. But then it starts to fail. For example, um, back in the day, it would say that the house is larger than the sun. And the problem is you don't know when the model is going to fail. You don't know 
when it's going to make a mistake, it doesn't have internal confidence. And so you just can't rely on its knowledge because you just don't know when it's going to start making things up. Okay, so in both formal reasoning and in world knowledge, we see substantial performance gaps that aren't fully solvable by either pattern matching or data memorization, the two things that large language models or neural networks in general are very good at. And so the question is, well, can we just get better by scaling it up or should we really shift to some kind of alternative mechanisms similarly to the human brain, which divides up mechanisms responsible for language, formal reasoning, world knowledge. And um, we think that this distinction that we've made between formal and functional linguistic competence is really insightful for figuring out where the field of NLP, large language models should go in the future. And we have, and we discussed two implications. One is that the, if the model wants to mirror the functional processing of language in humans, we want these models to be modular. So we need a module for linguistic processing, formal reasoning, world knowledge, etc. We don't need to build in this module in advance. So architectural modularity is when you might actually put in those modules there from the very beginning. But in principle, it's possible that this modularity might emerge with the right kind of training and the, and the right kind of training data. So you train the model end to end, but then the architecture is such that it allows for this modularity to emerge organically. And this new way of training models with reinforcement learning from human feedback might be a step in that direction, at least because now these, mo these models aren't just trained on the entire internet. They really seem to be carefully fine-tuned on a curated set of tasks like math and um, specific factual queries. So at least there is a step toward recognizing that there are distinct capabilities that need to be trained in distinct ways. And then the second implication, maybe less controversial, is that we need targeted benchmarks. So because formal and functional competence are distinct, they need to be evaluated separately. And so on the formal competence side, we showed you the BLIMP benchmark. There is also Syntax Gym and others that really draw on the field of linguistics to develop those carefully controlled, really neatly designed evaluations of specific uh, linguistic properties. For functional competence, there are many benchmarks as well, many common sense benchmarks, um, question answering, um, natural language inference. But I would argue that a lot of them are not clean in the same way. When they test the capabilities, they often test multiple capacities instead of just one. And so I think here there is actually a way for, for cognitive science to contribute to the development of those benchmarks. Okay, so to summarize, formal competence is knowledge of linguistic rules and patterns. Functional competence is non-language specific skills required for real life language use. And this distinction is grounded in neuroscience and can help clarify the discourse around large language models and also suggest a way to build better, more human-like language models. And I uh, would like to thank the rest of the team uh, after the rank of Tenenbaum and Blanca and Nancy Canvasher, with whom we've had many conversations to arrive at these ideas. There is a preprint online, and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Anna and Kyle. It was really an amazing talk. Okay, uh, let's get to questions then. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I have Ojam. Maybe I can start. Yes, Miguel. <laughs> Maybe introduce yourself first and then. Uh, yeah, sure. And hi, Anna. Hi, hi Kyle again. Uh, I'm Muge, a PhD student uh, in Quiz AI Center. So your research topic is really interesting for me. So that's why I'm really excited about your talk. So I, I prepared a couple of questions for you. Uh, maybe they are a bit general, I don't know. but. My first question is about the intention of these large language models. So you basically say these models actually do not have a real intent to communicate. I mean, they have nothing to say in, in base. So uh, we humans, uh, we want to uh, communicate because we have a, a drive. We have an innate drive to communicate because we want to survive. So. But these large language models uh, do not have this uh, innate, right? So what kind of mechanism can replace 
this in large language models you think for the innate drive i mean so instead of using diverse objective functions uh, do you think about an ultimate goal such as to survive for large language models so that uh, the emergent modularity can arise in these models yeah I, so I think that's an interesting question i think um i think the kind of like quicker and like the kind of easier step to giving them something like intentions is to just have them engaged in more goal-directed behavior which is something that we're starting to see happening right so if it has like some goal which is like to win a game or convince someone of something it will kind of behave as if it has an intention which I don't know to, that you get into kind of like philosophical questions about what is an intention and can someone which is not you know can something just because we've given it a goal have an intention but I think it could behave in some cases like it has an intention there I think you're kind of getting a, like a deeper point which is if we you know have a language model kind of interacting in the world in a more general way um like what what like humans right have goals in the world and you know from evolution and from culture and for a bunch of reasons have like stuff that we want to do mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to, i feel like yeah it's hard to actually think about what that would mean for a language model um but it, it, see, it, it seems, yeah, to highlight something which is very different from models and people right now, um, which is models, insofar as they have goals, it's because they're kind of told what their goals should be. Um, whereas people come up with new goals or decide they're gonna like kind of switch their space of goals, right? There's a bunch of different things there which models currently are doing. Mm -hmm. So for now, uh, all we have is uh, increasing the number of tasks, you say. I mean, different goals, different behaviors for the training. Yeah, I would say right now, it's, I would say it's still very task-based. Um, mm. Yeah, Anya, you have something to add there? Yeah, it's very interesting because when we were writing this paper, we wrote it right before ChatGPT came out and released, I guess, right after. And so um, state-of-the-art models, all of them for like a few years, were trained on the next word prediction task or word in context prediction tasks. Um, and so that goal, predict the next word, is very different from human goals doing things in the world. Um, we humans also engage in next word prediction, right? If I don't finish a sentence, you kind of figure you can figure out what I mean. Uh, and so um, in some way, limited way it's similar, but in general, this is a very different objective from what we humans do when we use language. Now, the reinforcement learning with human feedback, there, at least on the surface, it's a little bit more similar because you're training a model or you're fine tuning a model to produce answers that have a positive rating, a high rating by humans, and not to produce answers that have a low rating. And so you're kind of telling it good, bad, it's more, well, it is reinforcement learning, right? It's reward driven. And so that goal is something that seems more intuitive maybe for us humans. Like we wanna do things that we're told are good things to do and not the things that are bad things to do. So in that sense, it's a little bit more similar, but then the question is, yeah, will that be sufficient? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Uh, and I have one more question actually, uh, before I leave uh, the, uh, my order. So uh, these models also uh, do not really understand the uh, language. I mean, at least they're not real life language user, you, you say. So, uh, and the lack of word knowledge and some kind of common sense reasoning. Uh, of course, this is a not good thing, but sometimes it's advantages, like for example, for art or for creativity, for the originality. So, uh, do you also consider the current status of these models? I mean, uh, can we also exploit this not understanding uh, characteristics of large language models? I mean, e with these components, with this um, functional competence that you describe, you suggest uh, this uh, this characteristic will be preserved. It will be these characteristic preserved uh, in large language models? I mean, do you consider this? I think in principle, yes. Um, 
I have another preprint where we look at um, whether these models can distinguish plausible and implausible events. So um, the fox chased the rabbit versus the rabbit chased the fox. And it turns out that the model is very good at distinguishing possible and impossible events. So like the boy ate the apple versus the apple ate the boy. The second one, like totally impossible in most contexts you can think of. Um, and so the model is very good at distinguishing that. But when it comes to likely versus unlikely, like the fox chased the rabbit versus the rabbit chased the fox, um, it's actually not performing as well as humans would. And so probably it's because of the reporter bias overrepresenting unlikely events in the corpus. But it's also kind of nice because we want these models to be able to express unlikely events. We want to be able to think about the past, the present, the future, counterfactuals, fantasy stories, fairy tales, right? So we want this flexibility from the models. So we shouldn't necessarily want them to just be knowledge bases for us. That's very true. Now, the problem potentially with that though, is that these models are still very tied to the statistics of the input. They have trouble generalizing beyond. So if you want to create something completely new, these models can do that, but maybe like once that they can take two things and combine them and the, and the ability of them to really generalize is still very highly debated, but it seems that there is some kind of limit on how far they can go beyond their input. And because you can't control it very carefully, right? You, um, like the representations of individual objects and individual entities are, are not fully disentangled. It might also be hard to control. So if you wanna, like if you ask Dali to generate some outlandish scene, it will sometimes work and sometimes not, and you don't necessarily have control over it. But it okay. is a very interesting direction. Yeah, maybe I can ask a question. So I find it's really hard to draw a line between um, the formal structure and the functional competence. Uh, so for instance, where does one end and where, where does the other start? Uh, so we are speaking Turkish, which is a morphologically rich language. And I have a small son and he can produce words uh, which make sense, but doesn't exist in vocabulary. And I also know that in linguistic Olympiads, we have some linguistic puzzles and where you need to reason about the rules of the language. So you extract some kind of patterns. And I think that also requires some form of reasoning. So I, I was curious what you think about uh, that, that intersection of these two things. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely areas which are fuzzy between them, as is, I think, will always be the case when you like try to draw a boundary between areas. Um, so I think, I think it's especially interesting that there's cases where kind of world knowledge and formal linguistic grammatical knowledge intersect, like something like animacy, which, you know, animacy is a feature in the world, you know, some things are animate, you know, humans and animals are animate and, you know, rocks and, uh, you know, tables are not animate. And then often that in many languages that ends up being a grammatical feature. And so there's some interaction between what you know about the world and then how you like actually do grammatical processing. So there's definitely um, interactions there. I mean, and what you were describing, I, I definitely think that, you know, like something like a linguistic Olympiad um, is probably more like general problem solving and reasoning. Uh, when we're talking about linguistic competence, we're really thinking, and especially like what the language network is doing, we're kind of thinking of like a cons reasonably consistent set of phenomena in, in psycholinguistics that seems uh, like people are really quick at um, and that are kind of uh, like the fast language network, which lets us produce and comprehend language really fluently. And then when we hear something which doesn't sound right, kind of like sets off an alarm bell. Um, and it seems like that's a distinctive process from the kinds of like slower logical reasoning, mathematical reasoning, world knowledge, like all, which all might, well, one, we like talk about those things in language. And so like to use language, you need to know about those things. And then also they, you know, in these kind of fuzzy cases, like, um, you know, animacy or like what you were saying, where, you know, like creatively making up a new word or like, creatively solving a language problem using reasoning 
um, those are is like where you know if, if we believe there are separate modules, like that's where those would come together and have to interact and pass information in some way. Um, so I mean, yeah, I, I don't think we're trying to say that these are so distinct that you know you could there's no relation between them, or you could always for any given problem say this is one versus this is the other, as opposed to proposing it as a kind of useful framework for kind of making more sense of of problems in a, in, with language models. Okay, so yeah, and I know, yeah, I'll just add yeah. on briefly that I think this is exactly why it's been so hard to separate language and thought and practice because mm -hmm. it seems that the, the border is fuzzy. And so that's why as a neuroscientist, I'm very excited that now we can actually try to ground out this distinction in the human brain. We have a network that carries out a, a lot of computations related to language processing. And so the way to determine whether it's formal competence or not is to see whether the language network in the brain is engaged in that behavior. And so it's maybe the term itself is not going to be intuitively, like we, we might wanna draw this distinction in a different way based on just behavior, but at least we have an anchor. We have a neuroscience anchor where we can try, which we can try and use to separate out this core language behaviors from functional competence. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. I want to know. Maybe we should, when we, uh, for instance, propose a, an evaluation task, maybe we should do this human test first and say this requires yeah. this formal structure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, we have a question from Alkan Kabakcholu. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the for, oh, uh, for the talk. Um, I, I have a simple question. I, I was a bit intrigued by this uh, statistics that you showed about the, this uh, performance of the large language models on simple arithmetics, right? In, you know, with several digits, etc. And uh, although you know, on the news we've been hearing about this, uh, you know, GPT four path, you know, getting very high scores from SAT exams, which in my mind this should be, you know involve tasks much more you know demanding than just adding a couple of numbers etc so i mean isn't there some uh, I'm, are we misinformed on that front uh, is, do, do you have any comment on this i mean i think it speaks somewhat to the brittleness of the models that they um Right, like they, they can demonstrate some kind of knowledge in some domain when the question's asked a certain way. And so I think like SAT style questions, mm -hmm. they kind of uh, are in domain. And so like they've seen a lot of, so they're like, it kind of gets it into a mode where it can answer these kinds of questions. But if it's in a more conversational mode, uh, yeah, it might not. So I think like, right there, you could imagine the same problem you know the, the same kind of underlying math problem phrased in different ways and kind of triggering different dial like you know in different dialects or different styles um and actually getting different answers um yeah which is interesting this is something i've been thinking about a bit this, this kind of relationship between like reading and language and math problems right so it's not just you know you, you might think if they're competent they should be able to do you know four plus seven equals eleven like no matter how it's asked, um, but it turns out it depends how it's asked. So, so, yeah. so, so, you, 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 it may be, you know, the, the, the similarity between uh, the most recent SAT exam and the past exams is more than what meets the eye. Yeah, even that similarity, just that, uh, like somehow, like seeing an uh, SAT problem, it can recognize, oh, this is an SAT problem, and then engage like whatever skills it's learned for solving SAT problems, but it doesn't mean it'll use those same competencies when solving a problem that's kind of doesn't, you know, seems more like uh, informal conversation. I see. Okay. It's also unfortunately hard to interpret these results because mm -hmm. the models are closed, the evaluations are self-reported. We don't know what it was trained on. We don't know how it was trained. We don't know if it was, it's, they say it wasn't fine-tuned on those specific exams, but yeah, it's just so obscure that it's really hard to make sense of these results just because we don't know what went into them. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I have one more question. 
So this is about general computer science knowledge. I'm not computer science, cognitive science knowledge, because I, I don't know much about it. So you talked about the separation of language and thought networks in human brain. Uh, so do we know anything about how this separation occurs in the developmental stage? Does it like, is it separated from the beginning? So shall we focus on having modular architectures <laughs> or does it separate afterwards? So we should focus on reinforcement learning from human feedback. What is the, the status of it? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, both, there is predisposition for the language network to develop in a particular part of the brain, as we know. But if um, a fetus, a developing baby, develop, has a stroke really early in infancy, the language network can actually shift to a different hemisphere, and it's not going to have any effect on the function. So the brain in its early stages is very, very plastic. And so there is some predisposition for certain functions to go in certain places, but actually there is a lot of potential for the brain to reconfigure and rewire itself. So that potentially um, is an argument in favor of more flexible architectures where you don't build in a lot of structure in advance. But I also don't fully know how closely we should be guided by development. I guess it is like maybe the surest way to make to get a system that's similar to humans if it, it goes through the same developmental stages. But I don't think it has to be the case. I don't know, Kyle, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a, yeah, it's an interesting question. There is this, I don't know if anybody watched on Zoom or attended in person this NYU Philosophy of Deep Learning conference that Anya spoke at last week, um, and there was a kind of controversial talk there saying that cognitive science has nothing to contribute uh, to AI because, you know, progress is being made without, you know, taking inspiration from humans, which I think the speaker then kind of admitted wasn't totally true because like neural networks themselves are kind of biologically inspired and reinforcement learning is biologically inspired, <laughs> like almost all of the major pieces are actually uh, kind of inspired by cognitive science. Um, so I don't know, I, I, my take is that it will continue to be useful to think about cognitive science um, and the analogies to the human brain. Uh, but yeah, I don't know, I, I'm biased as a cognitive scientist. Um, I, I also recognize, like, I think it is true that just kind of scaling up and like large scale engineering solutions have been like a huge part of the success of these models in the last few years. And so, yeah, I don't know, I'm a bit torn. I, I could kind of see it going either way that yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have a strong prediction, I guess. Yeah, that's a tough one. So I feel like in an LP, we were going kind of the opposite way that you were describing, like having language and thought as separate units. We started feeding, I mean, we started turning every NLP task to a question answering task. Then we trained like unified models. Then the models got bigger and bigger. We trained them with more and more tasks and that's why i hope uh, the answer is they are separated afterwards otherwise all nlp or like if of, of course we are going with the biologically plausible way then we are yeah. heading to the wrong direction it's, it seems i mean that that was one of our points we did want to make with this paper was that i mean we think it's it's kind of an interesting and surprising result that the kind of language modeling objective has been as successful as it has been for formal competence, but that we don't necessarily think the word prediction, like, you know, the same NLP word prediction paradigm will necessarily be the way forward for like all aspects of cognition, even though it continues to be make, I think, surprising progress on various domains. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions? I have one final question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, as humans, we actually use our emotions while we are trying to interpret things. For example, we go to a movie and we say we liked it. And um, also in writing reviews for these stuff, 
um, we actually incorporate all the emotions we have into our writing. And when someone else reads it, um, it is definitely there that there is some kind of emotion, whether it is positive or negative. So uh, I want to ask for the language models. I mean, um, when we look at the language models, what it feels to me is that um, they're deprived of emotions. Is there a way that we can incorporate emotions into language models so that when we ask them to, for example, to generate a prose, um, I will also get a feeling that this is a feeling prose, like um, it had some negative feelings about the performance or something else. The language models are actually pretty good at sentiment classification, right? That was one of the easiest tasks for these models to begin with. And that's probably because there is a strong correlation between the words that we use or the phrases and the underlying emotion. So good is positive, bad is negative. And it's similar to, um, let's say just vision, right? So these models can't see, but they learn a lot about the visual structure of the words of the world through language say like which colors are closer to one another, that red is more like orange than it is like blue. Uh, so you learn a lot about the world through language indirectly. And my guess would be that you learn a lot about emotions as well. But and I so, still, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I yeah, but, but get this interpretation from the usage of the words, not because, um, for example, let's say we watched a musical and it was a um, fancy musical with um, positive feelings and we get this from the um, the nature of the words that is used in it not because the um, model was incorporating that feeling am I right well that's the question right yes yeah, so probably yes if we look at you know there isn't like in humans we have emotions then they translate into words models just have access to the words and they can kind of maybe latently infer emotions in some way, but not explicitly and in an imperfect way because all they get access to is the words. But the question is why, like, what is what is the purpose? Like, like, is that sufficient or do we actually want to model the actual emotions? Do we want a model that will watch a movie and have its own feelings about it? Like, it depends on your application, right? I was thinking of the latter one, like having its own emotions about after watching it. Yeah, I think that, that that's not a that's not a language model anymore, right? That's a model with feelings, with its own thoughts, with its intellect. That's a cl very close to our, like artificial general intelligence. Yeah. Um, whether or not so, like, it, so essentially, yeah. If you want to think about this task, then don't think about it as a, as a language model anymore because it's no longer about just language. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then let's thank our speakers again, Anna and Kyle. Thanks a lot for joining. It Thank was a great inviting. pleasure to have you and really nice yes. meeting you and hope to see you sometime face-to-face uh, -face in a conference soon. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Thank you very much. This was fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.